by 2030, we were going to have 87% of the population obese or overweight. And right now in the United States, we're a little over 72%. 72% of us, John, are overweight or obese. Welcome to Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. I'm your host, Dr. Richard Lewis Miller. The mission of Mind, Body, Health, and Politics is to enhance your physical and emotional well-being and encourage community. I say encourage community because I believe that human beings are basically tribal animals, and we do the best and we're the healthiest when we live in small tribes. Today on Mind, Body, Health, and Politics, I have the privilege of being able to interview Dr. John McDougall. I've been following Dr. John McDougall for mm, probably 30 years uh, since sometime he came out with his book, The McDougall Program, which was in 1990. And uh, at the time, I was experimenting, and I have been experimenting my whole career, which is over 60 years now. Uh, I've been experimenting with various kinds of nutritional plans. And at the time when I ran into the McDougall program, I was experimenting with the Pritikin program. And then I moved over to the, uh, to the McDougall program. And as many of you know, I've experimented with many others since, and I'm on my own particular program now. But we're going to talk about McDougall's program today. So welcome to Mind, Body, Health, and Politics, John. Well, you got the history pretty close, I'll tell you. Nathan Pritikin is one of my heroes. In fact, he wrote the only introduction that he has ever written to a book. He wrote that in the McDougal plan. So it's one of the, my great honors in life that I knew this man, who we all, I mean, there's probably nothing you're going to hear original today. And Nathan Pritikin uh, was really one of the pioneers. I'm not sure there is anything that's original. Maybe it's we all find new ways of saying the old stuff. But between us, so. between you and I, John, we've got over 150 years of experience. So we probably have something to say. Uh, you've got to be 77 or 8 by now, uh, correct? Yes. You're right. And I'm 85. Right. I'm 85. And we're both in good health. So something we're both doing is right, in addition to whatever our wonderful genetics are that allow us to be here. Question for you. What's that stuff on that beautiful stuff on the wall behind you? Well, this is where our, our roots are. Uh, we, uh, we left Michigan back in uh, about 1972. And uh, I went to Hawaii. I served some time as a surgical intern at the Queens Medical Center. And then I got a job as a sugar plantation doctor on the Big Island, Hawaii. And this is where I learned everything about medicine and the practice I have today. I had the job of taking care of 5,000 people who were primarily from Asia, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, Filipinos. That was a large part of the working pop population of the sugar plantation. And I had a chance to observe them in terms of their health. I was their doctor. You know, I caught a hundred of their babies. I did brain surgery on them in the middle of the night. You know, I, I pretty much did everything. Uh, I was the nearest specialist from uh, within 50 miles. So, you know, I really had close care of these people. And what I saw was a difference in health in the generations. My first generation, in other words, those who were born and raised in Asia, like China, Japan, Philippines, Korea, they were extremely healthy. They were never overweight. They never had heart disease or breast cancer or autoimmune diseases. Uh, they were trim and hardworking into their 80s. I had many, many uh, of my patients who were, they were retired, but they were in their 80s, uh, who were still in great health. So I, I saw this disparity between the health of my older generation and the next generation, second, and the third generation, and the fourth generation. I was taking care of all of them. What I saw was the first generation was extremely healthy, avoided the diseases I was trained on as a doctor, as an internist. The second generation got a little fatter and sicker. By the time you got to the third generation, they were as sick and overweight as anybody I'd ever seen in my training. The only thing that had changed you know, genes hasn't changed, I and mean, genes don't change uh, in that period of time. The, their, their environment, same work they did for 100 years on that sugar plantation. The only thing that changed was their diet. In Asia, they learned a diet based on rice. 90% of their food was rice. 
with fruits and vegetables and very little animal products, no dairy because they were lactose intolerant and uh, just small amounts of meat at most. The second generation, they got exposed to the Western eating patterns. In fact, uh, I joked that we had uh, uh, Texas Drive-In, the home of the Malasada, right from up from the plantation that people used to go to and gorge out on and, and develop the American diseases. First McDonald's came to Hawaii in 1974, came to Hilo, Hawaii. And by the way, Richard, I was one of their first and best customers back then. <laughs> so anyway, I had I had these people to learn on in terms of, I learned about two things, really important things. One is my patients didn't get better. Even though I had 5,000 people to take care of and I tried as hard as I could, they just stayed sick. No matter how many pills I gave them, no matter how many surgeries I sent them off to, they stayed they, they they didn't get well, and so I thought I was a bad doctor. Well, and that's why I went me, back into. Let me interject a question: As you were getting to generation two, three, and four, I believe, were you yeah. seeing an increase in weight as oh, each tremendous. generation passed, so that three Amen. were more overweight than two, and two were more overweight than one? Really. Clearly, all the diseases that I learned to treat in my medical training in Michigan and on Oahu, I didn't see in the first generation. Only they appeared in the second, third, and fourth generation with increasing frequency as people made the adaptation to the Western diet. They got fat uh, and sick. In, increasing, in, increasing frequency of overweight and obesity. Is that correct? Yeah. And diabetes and breast cancer and colon cancer, and heart disease, and yeah, all the diseases that we see in our friends and relatives. What years Why were you, at, the, when did this happen, uh, John? What years were you there taking care of these 5,000 people? Between 1973 and 1976. Okay. And then I went, as I thought I was a bad doctor, Richard. I mean, I took this personally, uh, you know, because my patients wouldn't get well, and I thought uh, I was supposed to make all these miracle cures you know, I'd seen Ben Casey, doctors, Dr. Welby, and, uh, and Marcus Welby, and Ben Casey, and Dr. Kilder. You remember the TV shows we saw? I was supposed to exercise those kind of miracles in my patients, and my patients never got well. Yeah, but all those Not doctors, nothing. all those doctors on television weren't dealing with obese and overweight patients, and you were. And there's a key factor there, and we both know it. Obesity and well, overweight I leads to all kinds of problems. It leads to diabetes, as you well know, as well as anybody. It leads to cardiovascular problems. And there's some evidence it leads to cancer, right? Well, regard, yeah, absolutely. You, you got the whole story right. But the important thing is I had a chance to observe 5,000 people go from generation to generation and get fatter and sicker as they change from a rice-based diet to the well-balanced American diet of animal foods and oils. People got sick. They always do. And it's not I, just I, my I, plantation. I, 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 if I may say, I think you're being extremely diplomatic when you refer to the American diet at that time as being well-balanced. Because I, from my perspective, there was nothing well-balanced about the American diet back then. We were doing the same thing we're doing now, which is selling the poor people processed foods with all kinds of junk thrown in to make it taste in different ways or to preserve it but it, does, it loses its nutrient value. And that's what Americans were eating, right? McDonald's, look well, at McDonald's, my gosh. Uh, uh, one of the biggest selling products in, in the world. But uh, I, you and I are not, not gonna uh, eat on it. Well, we used to call that a well-balanced diet, Richard. <laughs> that, that's how we used to refer to it as a well-balanced diet. I know, I do know. Go ahead, please. Anyway, I went back into training I found out the problem wasn't mine, Rich. It wasn't that I was a bad doctor. It's just that what they taught me didn't work. You know, it, it plain and simple changed the signs and symptoms of disease, but nobody ever got well. And the reason is, is they didn't deal with the problem. The problem, Richard, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you this in three words, and I'm going to repeat it during our interview. The problem, it's the food. It's the food. That, that's all you have to focus on. It's the food. And then what you need to do, understand is the way to get yourself out of trouble is you need to change the focus of your diet from what Americans eat to the focus of what my traditional Asian patients ate 
problem is is that we have, we have we have switched from the traditional Asian diet, which is a starch-based diet. Rice, you think of as Asians eating rice. Any kind of starch would be just fine. Corn, beans, potatoes, sweet potatoes, breads, pastas, those kind of starches. We've switched from a starch-based diet to a diet based on animal foods, primarily dairy products and meat, and a diet heavy in vegetable oils. That's why people are sick. But it's happened all over the world. It's not just my sugar plantation patients in Hawaii. It has happened, well, you can go, go to Japan today, uh, and you can see this kind of transition. You're, you're old enough. You remember, we had something in our time called the Vietnamese conflict. You remember that? They only used to show too, newsreels. Only, only too well. Okay. They used to show newsreels of people in Vietnam and Thailand and Cambodia of 100,000 people standing in a time in, in a town square. Nobody, nobody was overweight. If you go to Korea, Japan, Cambodia today, you'll find the wealthy people, the business people, the politicians. And I could name some of the politicians like those from Korea that demonstrate this very well. The rich people who have, a, uh, who have changed their, their dinner plate to what Americans uh, eat Almost universally, they get fat and sick. Whereas the rest of the Korean population, for example, living on mostly on rice, still everybody's pretty trim. Only those have changed their diet. You can see this. Your, your audience ought to be able to look around. I, I assume you, you deal with an audience that's put a few years with them. They ought to be able to look around and remember what I'm telling you. You know, there used to be a time when you thought about people from Asia. If I mentioned Japanese or Chinese, the first thing that came to your mind, well, these are thin people. And the second thing that came to your mind is they live on rice. You know this. What my audience remembers, John, is that when I started this program 20 years ago, the percentage of obese and overweight people in the United States was in the 50s, low 50s, and increasing. And I predicted at that time that by 2030, we were going to have 87% of the population obese or overweight. And right now in the United States, we're a little over 72%. 72% of us, John, are overweight or obese. I think that's one of the biggest uh, health problems facing the country. Richard, I can show you a paper that was just published that shows that 91% of Americans are too fat for their health. 91 percent. I believe you. I believe so you. So your data is a little shy of what the current obesity well, I, rates I'm, are. Well, I, oh, I'm talking about, uh, uh, yeah, you're, you're saying about if just being overweight itself, they're, they're heavier than they should be, is, is as high as 90. I'm with you. I'm talking about te see. technically in terms of pounds, overweight and obese. So the numbers are very high. And the numbers of diabetics extremely high too, isn't it, John? I mean, I've heard, I don't know what you've heard, that one out of three children born right now are going to be diabetic in the United States. Well, right now, about somewhere between 12 and 14 percent of Americans are frankly diabetic. Half are pre-diabetic. Well, let's go back to China for a minute. In 1980, in China, there was no type 2 diabetes. There was no obesity. In 1990, 90 percent of the food was white rice, 90%. No diabetes, no obesity. Today in China, 12% of the Chinese are frankly diabetic. 50% are pre-diabetic. So we see, as I say, you see it all over the world. You can make the same observations that I made in the 70s at my sugar plantation. This is not a secret, folks. What you're saying, John, is that when we've gone from poverty food, which is rice and beans, tortillas, what the Mexic poor Mexicans eat, rice and beans, and tortillas, what the poor Chinese eat, rice, Asians eat, poor Chinese. What you're saying is when we've gone from poverty food to middle class or higher food, we've gotten sicker. Yeah, I call it the diet for the aristocrats. We eat like kings and queens. That, that's, you know, traditionally, this has been going on for thousands of years. This is not new. You can look at, uh, at uh, 
archaeologic findings in Egypt. You can look at the pyramids, the mummified remains from 4,000 years ago. And if you analyze uh, the bones in these people or the hair, the, these mummies, you find what they eat. You, you find out what their diet was. And you find their diet was you know, like the American diet. And these people were diabetic. They had uh, obesity. They had atherosclerosis. So, you know, this has existed for 5,000 years at a time, at a time at least I know for 5,000 years, at a time where there were no cigarettes. People exercised plenty. There were lots of sunshine. The only thing we're talking about is a change in food. Richard, it's the food. John, tell us why we should be careful, very careful about eating oils. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a hard one for people. A lot of folks have the idea that eating beef is bad for them, and maybe even they're at the point where dairy is bad for them. They are kind of dealing with the, uh, uh, you know, they're having a little trouble giving off the cheese. But they, they stick their oil. I hear this all the time. I can't give up my oil. I don't know how to cook. It doesn't taste good without oil. Well, that's not true. Uh, oil doesn't taste good. Y I'll give you some examples of why you know it doesn't taste good. What do they call a restaurant with a bad reputation? What? A greasy spoon, right? <laughs> you know, when you, when you get oil on your hands and face or on your kitchen counters, you immediately wash it off. So it's so disgusting. Oil has no, virtually no taste at all. It's repugnant. Why they use oil, Richard, is to get things that we like to stick to the food. We like sugar, salt, and spice. Oil gets the sugar to stick to the donuts. Oil gets the salt to stick to the french fries and potato chips. You see, it's, 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 it acts as a vehicle. Oil is an unnatural substance. It does not occur in nature in a free state. You what, have about, process... what about, excuse me for interrupting. What about the oil from nuts? Are nuts okay from your perspective? I don't think they're unhealthy. Okay, I don't. I think it's okay to eat them for health and weight, gaining weight. But I think nuts and seeds and avocados, because they're ninety percent fat. If your if your goal is to lose weight, you can't eat foods that are ninety percent fat. So right. you know it depends on the situation. But otherwise, if you're trim like you and I are, if you're not looking to lose weight. Are nuts okay to eat with the amount of oil they have in them? Richard, na nature makes very few, if any, mistakes. And nuts and seeds and avocados being plant foods, you know, have their, their purpose, their design, and also their protections. Uh, the reason that, uh, that nuts and seeds are protected often is because they put them in hard shells. You know, think about a coconut. The reason avocados aren't a big part of people's diet is they only come in bloom you know, for a week or two a year. Whereas if when you go to the grocery store, you know, nuts are available all year long and so are avocados. So if you're trying to, if you're just trying to be healthy or you want to gain weight, nuts and seeds and avocados are fine. But because they're 90% fat and the fat you eat is the fat you wear, you're not going to lose weight making yeah. nuts a big part of your diet. And so we have a lot of vegans who have made some really important transitions in their diet. They've given up animal foods completely, and yet they're still overweight. I call them the fat vegans. You know, half, I would say half of the people who pronounce that they are vegans will stand up and say, I'm a vegan. Half of them should be embarrassed because they're overweight or obese because they don't understand the importance of fake foods, you know, like your Boca burgers and your soy hot dogs and uh, your fake cheeses. They don't understand the implication of those. And they're heavy into oil, you know, safflower or corn oil. Uh, but isn't the McDougal, oh. the McDougal diet, isn't it pretty close to veg veganism? It's perfectly veganism. All right. The diet is 100% vegan in practice and in every single recipe and every single book. However, I'm not a silly man. And that this is not a religion. What people need to understand is that the best diet to regain your lost health and to preserve your personal appearance and health, the best diet is a diet based on starch, not just vegan. It's a diet based on starch like corn and rice and potatoes with the addition of fruits and vegetables. That, that's a diet that supports good health. 
but it's not an all or nothing thing in the sense that, you know, if you had turkey on Thanksgiving, you know, or, or a bottle of nuts on your, on your birthday, you know, that that's the human body's tough. So, you know, to make this kind of all or nothing restriction to people, it, it's not a practical thing to do. However, I do tell them this, Richard, which is really important, is the reason I teach it in terms of, of red and green, black and white, yes and no, no compromise, is because of the fact that people will do their own cheating. Yes. I don't have to cheat for them. So I teach you the best I know. You do the best you can. The problem with cheating is that it leads to complete destruction. You know, yes. being moderate being moderate kills. Uh, what happens when you add a little bit of the bad stuff back, you just can't control yourself. You know, it's like cigarette smoking. I've never met a smoker who has cut down in order to quit. They've always just, boom, today I'm done. I've never met an alcoholic who switched to beer and wine and solved their problem. They've never done it. And it's the same thing with the food. You can't have a birthday cake in your refrigerator and just nibble on it once in a while. You know, that cake's gone in one meal. Because you're an addict, or I guess not. Really, you're a heavily habituated person. You're just too much into the story about eating rich foods, and you're so in trouble. So, jo John, if a person takes on this program and they stay with starch and vegetables, where do they yeah. get their where do they get their protein from? Same place elephants get their protein, and giraffes and monkeys. Uh, there's no such thing as protein deficient. It's n Richard. I I, I I'm a a person of the scientific literature. I am a scientist. And I've thoroughly looked at what has been written historically and in the National Library of Medicine. Richard, there has never been a case of protein deficiency ever reported due to any diet, any natural diet that provides enough calories. It is impossible to do. You couldn't do it. No scientist could do it. No, you can't do it. There's always enough protein in all the foods, oranges, sweet potatoes, Rice, corn, always enough. You could, like I say, you can grow horses and cows on vegetable foods. And plus, you think around, ladies and gentlemen, audience out there, how many friends and relatives you have that have protein deficiency? You got you got friends and relatives with protein excess. They've got kidney disease, liver disease, and osteoporosis, and kidney stones from all that protein. People who have researched your program have noted that there's improvement in LDL decreasing the bad cholesterol. Right. They've noted that people's body mass index has gone down so that they've lost weight with your program. They've noticed less fatigue with people using the Medugal program. But they've also been critical and said that they've noticed deficiencies in iron, zinc, B12, D, calcium, and omega-3. What is your response to the criticism? I'm sure you like the accolades about the cholesterol and the BMI and the fatigue, but what, what do you say to well, the criticisms? Well, Richard, all I can say is you read Wikipedia, because that's the only place I know that that negative statement appears. And it's due to some researchers, uh, like a, a scientist from Kraft, I forget his name right now, that wrote about me in the 1980s. You know, and these people are 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 people I criticize all the time. But if if you, but that's that's just, I haven't been written about in those in that negative manner for at least 30 years. So, and besides that, how many people do you interview that have a whole page or two pages or three pages on Wikipedia? Not many. I do. So most of what's on Wikipedia is positive. You just happen to pick up on the negative stuff. And I know why, because you wanted me to answer the question. The answer to the question is they either are ignorant or they're, they've got an, another agenda out there because it's plain and simple and not true. The only thing that our diet is deficient in possibly is vitamin B12. It's not deficient in calcium, zinc, iron, protein, amino acids, or anything else. It's, you know, you can only, you can only fairly criticize me on the B12 issue, which is rather complex. Uh, the risk of B12 deficiency is less than one in a million. 
and it takes you 20 to 30 years to run out of B12. Let's just leave it at that. If anybody wants to know more, they can go to YouTube. I've got, I've probably got a hundred lectures. You look up McDougall and the subject, McDougall and B12, for example. Or you can go to my website, drmcdougall.com, and I have articles. I've got two huge articles with, with all the science there on the subjects, like B12 or protein or whatever. Plus, I've written 13 national best-selling books you can read. And I know you have. Otherwise, you wouldn't have had me on your show. John. So I, I, I have to leave I you know I'm telling the truth. I had your first book after it came out in 1990. I told you I jumped on it because I was already into Prinikin. Um, yeah, I have I, I have two grown daughters, John. Do you have children? I have uh, my oldest daughter is 50 years old. Okay, my oldest is uh, 49. And does your daughter well, follow them? Actually, she's 49. Go does, ahead. Your, does yours? By the way. We both also, you and I, both went to Michigan State University. You got your medical degree there. I got my PhD there uh, in East yeah. Lansing. Um, does does your daughter uh, follow the McDougal plan? Yeah, all our children do, and so do our grandchildren too. Now, not to the not to the extent that Mary and I do, but you know, I, I would say ninety five percent of all the family's food comes from starch and vegetables. They run into animal foods, you know, uh, candy bars, things like that, more often than I do. But yeah, our our, our children, yeah, we we, our children are very successful. And I assume yours are too. And it wasn't by accident, Richard. You know, Mary and I put a tremendous amount of effort into these three kids, and so you know they learned you know good morals to get a good education, and they learned how to eat from us. Yes. And they haven't forgotten it. And, yes. and I would I would put this out as a message to all parents. Is you may get frustrated with your children, but you have an opportunity to educate them. And you do so. You take them to church. You take them, you get them in good schools. Why do you send them out in the world to be fat and sick? Why don't you teach them how to eat? You have an obligation as a parent. And we did that, of course. We did it by serving all, all in our home was always clean. But you know, Richard, when our kids went out to birthday parties, we didn't tell them what they could eat. They could have pizza. They could do anything. They I didn't understand. often. Or if they did, they only ate, took a couple of bites and decided it wasn't very good. But we didn't make those kind of rules. Just our home was clean, and we taught them the truth. Well, now a very, very personal question. What's a typical, uh, what's a typical breakfast for you and Mary? Always the same. Let's hear Every it. morning. It's oatmeal with fruit. And the fruit that I do these days is frozen. And the reason is, is because if I buy fresh fruit, it spoils. So I've learned to take and buy extra fruit frozen, either initially frozen or fresh frozen, and I freeze it. And I always have oatmeal and fruit. That's my breakfast every morning. No exceptions. And there are, about, there are only about four things that we have uh, for breakfast, for, for lunch and dinner. I would just say, you know, Mary makes some some different new things maybe once or twice a week or maybe less often. But we have we have bean burritos one night and made of beans and rice and corn and salsa and salsa sauce and so on. We'll have, uh, or like last night, we had a rice dish, uh, kind of a Japanese rice dish. Uh, she'll make bean pizzas. Uh, we'll have potatoes quite often. One of our favorite meals would be the regular white potato or sweet potato with some vegetables. And, th you know, that'll be a whole meal for us. We can get some sweet potatoes so big I can't even eat them. They're so large. Uh, you know, so sweet potatoes as the center of our meal or regular potatoes. If you want to be satisfied, I mean, if you want to put yourself to a test about real satiation, about how good it feels full all over your body, stomach and body and mind and everything, Live on potatoes for a couple of days. It has been declared by scientific research to be the most satisfying of all foods is the potato. My daughter Serana taught me to take a Japanese sweet potato, put it in the oven 400 degrees for 50 minutes, and you eat it and it tastes like a candy bar. It really does, doesn't it? Yeah, it really it does. It really does. I, now, I don't understand. How could somebody... Take a, 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 a say a wing of a bird, 
or a leg of a cow and eat it. They don't. They can't. They won't. You can even cook it for them, and they won't eat it. I mean, how many of your friends will eat boiled chicken? They, they insist because the stuff tastes so yucky or bland. They insist you put barbecue sauce on it, steak sauce, ketchup, salt, sweet and sour sauce, anything to cover the darn thing up because you can't eat it plain. Try it. What you, what, well, what you and I know, John, is all those sauces were invented hundreds of years ago before we had refrigeration because not only was the meat bland, it was putrid. And so they invented the sauces to cover up the terrible tastes. And the French got to be the best at that. And basically, you're eating the sauces. Yeah, right. You're eating the sauces rather than the food. It's a point well taken, John. And I'm glad you mentioned it. Now, let's talk about Whereas you can eat that sweet potato. You can eat the sweet potato just the way it is. Oh, yeah. And love it. It tastes like sugar. And it's the same thing with, with you know, all the dishes we have. And I want to say something else right now to your listeners. If you think you don't like the McDougal diet, it's because of the salt. You're missing the taste of salt. And so what we do is we allow you to put a little salt and sugar on the surface of your food. You don't put it in the cooking. Okay, you put it on the surface where the tongue can taste it. And if you do that, all of a sudden, something that is unfamiliar and bland will be, oh, I love this. Yeah, because right. you love you could, the salt. Exactly. It's on the tip of your tongue. You are a salt seeker. Eat it. You, you see, this has been a scapegoat for the, the food industry is to blame everything on salt. And then it became everything on sugar. No, folks. The problem is the animals and the oils. Those are the two problems. It's not salt and sugar. They may not be health food. You know, sugar rots your teeth. Salt raises the blood pressure a little bit. But it's not the villain that we've been taught. And the reason we've been taught salt and sugar is a villain is so we would focus our attention on these two ingredients rather than the real problem, which is the bacon. It's the pig. It's not the salt. It's the pig when you eat bacon. You don't like the pig. You like the salt. You'd, I'm, I've said enough. Well, you're saying well, but I think we ought to give a little caveat. Because you're talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, but I think you're talking about relatively moderate amounts of salt and sugar, whereas in the American diet, people are eating so much salt and so much sugar that a, a large amount of salt will affect your blood pressure more than a little tiny bit, and a large amount of, of sugar can affect your cardiovascular system or create inflammation in the system. When people are eating, you know, six bottles of uh, soda pop full of sugar every day, not to mention the fact that that's 900 or 1,000 calories, right? It's a, a, and it's rotting their teeth. It's also having an effect on the inside. So just want to point that out to the listeners. You're not advocating large amounts of salt and sugar. No, we put it on the surface of the food, Richard. But I'll tell you, there are many points if you want someday that we can contest about what you just said. Because I think there's some points of view that may modify your opinion on both these substances. But we'll save that for another another interview. Uh, you mean when I said large amounts of salt and sugar? Well, I think I think you condemn salt and sugar for more serious effects than they really cause. Like, for example, if you lower your sodium intake by 1,750 milligrams down to 2,300 milligrams, which is the current recommendation, you drop the top number by three points and the bottom number by six tenths of a point. That's all. With a 1750 millimeter drop or milligram drop in sodium, you drop it by three over six tenths of a millimeter of mercury. That's it. Now, when you get into extreme deprivations of salt, like Walter Kempner used, you, 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 Walter Kempner used to wash the rice so that he would get the salt off of it. But I don't think the salt was the problem. He also used to feed a diet of rice and fruit and fruit juice and table sugar. You know Walter Kempner, Richard? Do you know Say Walter Kempner's work for Duke, Duke University? Yes, of course, at Duke, yes. Uh, yeah, okay, well, the rice diet. But, but see, you have to go to those extreme levels. You have to go to fewer 
than 500 milligrams of sodium a day to get profound effects of salt on blood pressure. Otherwise, the, the, the difference in salt intake has such a small impact on the body, on blood pressure in particular. What really makes the difference is the whole diet, you know, the whole getting rid of the animal foods and the oils and bringing in the starches, vegetables, and fruits. It's not just the sodium. Sodium has just a tiny, tiny effect unless you get extreme. Tell us what you have against the animals in terms of eating them. Well, uh, you know, I started out mostly can only concerned about my patients, not just mostly. I actually couldn't understand the animal rights people or the people inter interested in the environment. But, you know, as I learned the impact of animal foods and oils on my patients, it became mm -hmm. clear what I had to do as a doctor. But then I became sensitive and it was a maturation on my part. It was a growth on my part because I was wrong. Uh, I Over the years, and I'm talking about decades, now I've come to appreciate the importance of animal welfare. And I involved, uh, I'm involved very much and okay. it's totally dedicated to the positive effects the McDougal diet can have on getting carbon dioxide out of the, out of the atmosphere and saving our planet. The foundation exercise uh, website, the link, I'm going to give it to you now. It's McDougal, M-C-D-O-U-G-A-L-L, foundation.org, McDougalfoundation.org. Go oh, there. You'll, you'll, you'll see how one person can make a difference in the environment by changing their diet. McDougalfoundation.org. Go there. So John, yeah, I don't. Uh, it's yeah. not just the health of the people. It's it's a whole bunch of other things. You know, we could get into we can get into uh, discrimination among uh, among people and and how fair it's unfair it's been to you know to have kind of a class order in our society where once upon a time it was the rich people who ate the rich food who got sickest and now it's the rich people who are found out about food and they're getting healthier. Whereas the people who are less privileged, who before could only afford beans and rice and sweet potatoes, now they become wealthier. And now all the garbage food is put on the less fortunate, the underprivileged, the poor, the disadvantaged. They get all the garbage from the meat and the oil industries. So, you know, there's some there's some uh, some societal issues here, and racial issues that we're, we're talking about. So, yeah, this goes to every place. You know... It goes to the fact that we're we're disrupting our healthcare system. Seventeen percent of the gross national product is paid for by the government. It's it's due to uh, to food related diseases. Now, if we could you know cut that percentage in half or two thirds, can you imagine what we do to health insurance and hospitals and doctors? And good grief, we'd have doctors driving taxi cabs, which many of them should be doing. <laughs> it's funny. When you started talking about adding salt and sugar and pepper, as soon as you started talking about pepper, I started sneezing. Did you notice that? And I, every time now I think about pepper, I start to sneeze. John, in the McDougal plan, tell us about the place of hydration. Well, we, we, we encourage you to drink to in response to your thirst drive. I, I don't force eight glasses or 10 glasses of water a day on somebody. I, I believe... I believe the human body was designed correctly. In other words, I don't count the number of breaths I take a minute to make sure I get in enough oxygen. Okay? I trust my breathing drive. I don't count the glasses of water I take in. I trust my thirst drive. It's always, always been accurate before. And likewise, I trust my hunger drive to take in the right amount of food. The difference here is when it comes to breathing and water, you only got one choice. That's oxygen or H2O. When it comes to food, you've got avocados to zebras to eat. You know, it, choice is where you get into trouble. And if we were choosing the right foods, the hunger drive would never fail us. And the right foods are starch, rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, breads, pastas, the foods you love but you were told to hate. They, were li they lied to you. And look at the results. 91% of people are too fat for their health. You know, breast cancer, one in six people. Constipation, probably universal. 
I mean, it's it's a devastating pandemics by the lies told by industry. But there's a lot of money to be made. Did you know your grandparents, John? Uh, yes, I knew on one on each side. And were they trim? Um, were they trim, or were they uh, over a little overweight? What were they like? They they were they were fairly. Uh, well, let's just say they had better health than the next generations. But but I can't say my grandfather was trim. He lived on. He died at 80, 86 years old. My grandpa, old pop, did. He lived on meatballs and onions for lunch and dinner, and he ate fried eggs for breakfast. There is a testament to the human body. Of course, he died of atherosclerosis at 86. He died of kidney failure due to hardening the arteries of the kidneys due to his diet. Well, but, you, yeah. Uh, how about your parents? I, 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 you... My parents were trim. Let's go back to my great-grandmother, okay? Let me tell you about old mom. My great grandmother, when I was a kid, she used to look at me when we had we were over for for meals, and she'd look at me and my sister Kay, and she'd say, "You know, you guys eat too much meat. You're going to get sick uh, as you get older." And we of course laugh at her. And then many years later, when I became vegan, I was over visiting her, and she asked me to go out and get her a hamburger. I knew what she wanted, so I went out and got her a hamburger, brought it back, unwrapped it. It was, uh, you know, air, air, air filled buns and a thin layer of chopped meat and pickle, ketchup and onions, you know, the typical uh, 35 cent hamburger. She took that hamburger. She cut it into quarters. She took one quarter. She shook it in my face. She, she said, you know, John, if you ate more meat, you'd be healthier. And then she went and consumed a whole quarter and she put the rest away in the refrigerator. She was a moderate person by design. I'm not. At that same restaurant, I ordered two double cheeseburgers and two malt, two shakes and a big <laughs> order of fries. So, yeah, you know, I have some relatives who are moderate and lived on starch-based diet because those are the times. So I said she lived to be 106. She died of old age. I bet if somebody guaranteed you could be 106 and they made you sign on the dotted line, you'd do it. Absolutely. I know you. Uh, hey, you know, let me, let me tell you a little side note here. Uh, by by uh, uh, kinetics uh, of cell division and by what's said in the Bible and historical readings, writings, and so on, the normal lifespan of a human being, do you know what that is? You know, like, like a Drosophila fly lives five days and a tortoise lives 140 years. Do you know how long a human being lives? Tell us. I want to hear it from you, because you're not going to like this. 85 years is the normal lifespan for a human being. I like now, that number. I, I like that. I like that number, John, because I'm 85. That, but that's it, man. You're done. We're, we've done our last interview. Okay. If you comply with normal uh, lifespan, but, I'll, but I'll, I want to tell you, you know, I'm I'm 77 now, and I don't like that number either. I, I'm I'm pushing for a lifespan of 95 myself, or maybe 105. I yeah. Don't, just thought I'd add that, a little personal note, Richard. So the reason I asked about your grandparents and your parents is because it's yeah. quite it's quite possible that you're genetically blessed with trimness, and that allows you to trust yourself with regard to hunger, because no. you you you're you're, you're self regulated. Uh, is self regulation is built into it's hardwired into your system. I don't you believe don't, that. You don't have to work no. at it. No, I no, personally, I, I personally have to work at it to be self-regulated because I don't know about you, but I have right now I'm nice and trim. It maybe you can see, I don't know if you can, but I'm very trim uh, and tall six, five, but I have been uh, over 90 pounds heavier than I am right now. Way back. That's how I got Me into too. this whole area. Oh, you were once heavy also. Yeah, I was about 230. I'm 140 now. Oh, so we've the same thing. We both have lost 90 pounds. That's uh, that's yeah. very significant. Now, I, sometime when you were a young man, I read that you had a stroke a very, very right. early in your life. How old were you that when that eight, happened? How old, John? I was 18. 18 My word. 18, so 58 years, I've walked with a terrible limp, uh, an incapacitating limp. As a result, as a result of the stroke. I had total total dense, dense hemiplegia on the left side. 
Do we know what caused it? Yeah, it was a lunar infarct caused by a rupture of a plaque due to my my diet. Oh, due to your diet. So there that was a big influence in you going into this whole field of nutrition. It was. It certainly gave me the right to talk to people about being sick. Yeah. Now, I, at 18, I had a stroke. When I was a little little boy, I was constipated, had terrible stomach problems. Uh, at 22, my mother called me fat. I had major abdominal surgery at 25. I'd have been dead by age 30. But because my parents, my parents were taught that the only important nutrients in their family's diet were protein and calcium. Yet there's never been a case of either protein or calcium deficiency ever reported. It's only plant components that you become deficient in, like vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, folic acid. You know, those are all plant components. But they were never taught that these were the things that we could develop diseases like scurvy and beriberi and pellagra. You know, those are the diseases of previous generations. We got we got ta we got taken over by the food industry, and they picked some things about their foods that fall into a category called unique positioning. It's part of marketing. What you do, Richard, you find out something unique about your product, and then you just advertise it to pieces. Like, for example, if you have a fuel efficient car. You know, and you say, oh, it gets 57 miles to a gallon. But they don't tell you it's built on such flimsy material you get, you get, you get killed in an accident. They don't tell you that. Right. You know, it's the same thing with the, with the, you know, they say, well, meat, we have lots of protein. And then they lie that we need all this extra protein. Yeah, it's got lots of protein. And dairy's got lots of calcium. But there's never been calcium deficiency. And eating dairy is one of the worst things you can do. So, yeah, my parents were taught. And so when I got... I didn't develop protein or calcium deficiency. What I got is constipation, lack of energy, a massive stroke, abdominal surgery, and obesity before I was 25 years old. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Oh, that is that is just stunning, John. What was the abdominal surgery for? Oh, I had an exploratory lap at age 25 when I was at Queens Medical Center because of abdominal pains. Wow. So they, they they did an exploratory laparotomy on me. They just cut your abdomen open and they look inside. And they took out my appendix, which was not diseased. It was just fine. But they were there, so they might as well take it out, right? You know, the business. Plus, they have to make a few extra dollars taking the appendix out. You know, you mentioned yeah. before that the animal issue isn't just about the effects of the animal on our system, but it's also political. And I just want to underline that. Because what we know, and I, th I know you know it quite well, John, is that forests are being cut down, but not for new buildings, as I used to think. Forests are being cut down to make more agricultural land in order to raise feed to feed cows because we have convinced everybody that eating cows is so important for them. So we're losing right. the forest to the agriculture. Yeah, and you know that. Richard, I want to take you one step further than our discussion here, okay? Because I know, you know, just the few minutes I've gotten to know you, I know you're a person who seeks knowledge and truth. Yes. We are so far, we are so far past our carbon limits because of, uh, of fo fossil fuel pollution, because of the, the meat industry. We have uh, raised the CO2 atmosphere, content in the atmosphere so high that we couldn't in a thousand years return it to a livable level. There is a website which I believe offers a solution, and it's the only only solution that I've been able to find that has any sense to it. It's a geoengineering website, and I'm going to give you the I'm going to give you the link. So be Good. ready. We're ready. It's, a, ge it's a, a geoengineering website done by volunteers, and that's why it's not popular. It's all volunteer. You can't make any profit out of this. It's building mirrors to reflect sun's energy off the planet and it's done with dumpster waste it's done with plastic bottles and aluminum cans the website are you ready uh, they call it let it's me guess is they call it the archimedes company no you know why they i say that they're probably trying to build carbon capture which okay. is just bs 
<laughs> this year, you're never going to build cameras. If trees can't do it, machines can't do it. Are you ready for the website? We are ready, John. All right. It's mir, M E E R dot org. M E E R dot org. It has nothing to do with food, it has nothing to do with our conversation. It's just that I have children and you have children and we probably have grandchildren. I know I do. And they need a world to live in. And we can't do it except by sensible geoengineering. You know, shooting seawater up into the clouds ain't going to do it. Uh, putting, you know, silicon dust up in the atmosphere ain't going to do it. Putting umbrellas next to the sun ain't going to do it. But you can make enough mirrors out of plastic bottles and aluminum cans to make it happen. You know, you it's know, just, for for those of you listening, for those of you listening, money thing, Richard. and those of you listening yeah. who think who think this idea of mirrors that John's referencing is off the wall, I I recommend that you look up Archimedes because Archimedes was the man who taught the people on the land to use shields that were highly polished, and they focused them on inv on invading ships, and they burned the ships down with the uh, light that was uh, reflecting off the uh, shields. And basically what John is saying is that we can do the same thing with this garbage and reflect the sun's rays back and perhaps burn up a lot of this carbon and stuff that's floating around that's creating the uh, the problems for us. Well, you know what I'm going to do, Richard? Yi Tao is the, the head scientist on this. And I, as soon as we get off our interview, I'm going to write him and tell him about Archimedes. And they're going to use that, thanks to you, as part of their promotion. That is just a great story. Thank you. You're welcome. And so maybe that's a good place to stop for today. I love the fact that John said to me, this is a, a, some of this material we're going to follow up with in the next interview, because it's been a great interview, and we're going to do another one. So thank you All so right. much. Hey, Thanks, John. It's Thanks for fun. being there. This is Dr. John I'm McDougall talking. of the McDougall Plan has been with you folks. And thank you all for listening to today's broadcast of Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. You know we come out with a new program every week, 9 o'clock on Tuesday morning. However, most of you listen to the archive. And remember, the archive is open source, which means we're not charging you. All the information from this program for the last 20 years is free to the public. It's our contribution to your health and well-being. So go to mindbodyhealthpolitics.org, check out the archives. Until next time, this is Dr. Richard Lewis Miller reminding you that good health is worth fighting for and it's essential for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs>